Hey everyone, I'm Eric Peckham, and this is the Monetizing Media Podcast. My whole focus is breaking down business opportunities across media, entertainment, and gaming. I'm joined by a leading entrepreneur, executive, or investor in most episodes to share tactical insights about the strategy of their company, an investment thesis they have, or topics like business models, pricing, and creating loyal fans. My guest today is Miles Perkins, who spearheads business development for Epic Games' Unreal Engine within the film and TV industry. I wrote a lot about the Unity game engine in past months for TechCrunch, ahead of that company's IPO. Well, Unreal is the other major platform for building games and other 3D content. Both engines have made a big push into Hollywood, where they're used to create the virtual settings for productions. Whether Unreal is used just for planning purposes, or to provide the actual setting on set through large LED screens surrounding actors, it lets editing happen in real time to make the setting, lighting, etc. look exactly like the director wants. While still early in gaining adoption in Hollywood, the use of game engines for virtual production has big consequences in the process and budgeting of creating video content. The highest profile production to use Unreal in a major way, with almost all acting happening on set surrounded by LED screens, is John Favreau's The Mandalorian series on Disney+. Plus. I highly encourage you to check out some of the behind-the-scenes videos on YouTube. Anyway, without further ado, let's jump in. Miles, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I guess maybe the, the best place for us to start is uh, just around terminology even because I've heard different ways yeah. of describing what's happening is the work done with unreal specifically virtual production or virtual set production, or is that a much bigger term? So I'm curious, as you look at what you're doing in this broader context of the digitalization of shooting content, what's the terminology that you prefer? Virtual production is accurate and, and what virtual production really it talks about, it's a much broader um, scope of things. I think a lot of times people think, oh, it's the LED screen or it's this thing or that. What The way I see it is it's it's us bridging the what has otherwise been a gap between what is physical and, and what is virtual. And so when I say bridging that gap, what I really mean is that the, the directors and the directors of photography, the cine, uh, cinematographers, the, the uh, set design people, all of those um, people are really used to being able to be on set and operating in, in the physical world. Well, how can I lay a virtual world over the top of that where they make a comment and say, hey, move this set piece. And them saying move this set piece is really no different whether it's physical or virtual. And that's really what it is. It's a continuum where both what's virtual and what's physical can live side by side. And you don't really have to have this switch where you have one vocabulary where you talk about one thing and a separate vocabulary where, where you talk about another. At, at a basic level, the fundamental changes here of shooting a film, a TV series, a commercial using this technology is... You, I think the most obvious one is location, right? You don't have to be all over the world shooting on location, at least as often, but in, in the real time editing aspect, right? Of if you want it to be a different time of day, if you want to change some aspect of the environment, you can do that right then and there, test it out and see how it looks. Are there other components that you think are um, really key here? So virtual production doesn't necessarily mean that there's also the in-camera visual effects or the LED screens. So virtual production can even just be that I'm starting off just as I'm starting to write a script, that I'm at the same time starting to actually visualize that. And something that we've called pre to this point, right? That is in, in some ways virtual production. But I think what has changed is that it's not simply a visual representation. It's also a spatial representation such that if I go out and I'm doing pre and I'm going to do it on a street that is a known street, within this pre it's not just, it's just not a, a visual representation of it. I know the width of the street. I know how cars fit. And not only that, but I know the time of day. So that when I say this is going to be on October 25th at, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon, I actually know that the shadows are going to fall exactly as they're going to fall at that date. 
So that is all of a sudden where you're starting to bridge the gap between what's physical and what's virtual. And now in virtual production, I could either take that previs that I'm doing and move it all the way into in-camera visual effects where I have a final pixel, or I could move it into something that is a little bit more of a post-production process though the director and the the director of photography or the cinematographer is actually interfacing with that virtual world no different than they would if they actually had a real physical camera and it was a real physical set. Filmmaking is generally very, very linear so that you each department has their responsibility and you're building one thing on top of another. In the 90s, we started to have computer is really taking more of a, a prominent role. And the byproduct was that you had to wait for it to render and that you could only look at certain components of it. So it, it wasn't that you were watching and looking at animation in its full lighted and, and with full textures and all that. No, you might be looking at a gray shaded version and you had to imagine what it was going to look like. And then you'd pass notes back and forth and you would never really see it until like weeks, if not months later. What we're talking about now is, no, you would see it just now in this moment, the same way that you would see it if it was something that was physical. Yeah. So because of that, it doesn't necessarily need to be linear. It can actually be that we're much more iterative in how we're doing things, even with editorial. So I could right now, the editorial knows what it, whether it looks right or not. They know whether the continuity is there. They, they ultimately can get to the story faster because they have all of the visual elements right there, even if they're not final. As you mentioned, there's so many different teams and components that go into a production. To be specific, where Unreal Engine falls within that versus, you know, I know you and I met during a, a demo of Unreal's work at, I think it was E3 over a year ago. And, and, and part of that was working with VFX teams like Lux Machina and using technology from Quixel, which your company has since acquired. So where do you draw the lines of this is where we fit in versus this is where traditional visual effects or other specialists just come in and make use of the technology? Well, we're, we're, we are in essence a, a platform or a set of tools, and these tools coexist with other tools that are out there. I think the big difference though is that up to this point, a lot of tools that visual effects people would use, they are just rendering portals. They just render what you tell it to render. And, and yes, maybe there are some physics involved, but you, you can bend it in any way you want to. Game technology is a bit different. And the, the difference uh, in what we're bringing, it has an impact on, on the visual effects teams and, and really many of the departments throughout the, the process. But the, the impact that it's having is that this one-to-one -one with the real world, that they're able to do things in the game engine that are what I refer to as if-then. So if you cross over this threshold, these birds are going to fly. And every time I do that, it's going to do that. Well, that's what happens on set. And set, I you are orchestrating things to happen, and you have your department heads that are making things happen there's no difference here. And, and, and as a matter of fact, those department heads may be using the same tools that they have typically used, except there are hooks that go into the Unreal Engine that allow for this gamification of the visual. And when I say gamification, I don't, I, I do mean it's interactive, but it's interactive in order to tell a, a linear story. Mm -hmm. And that's the exciting part, you know, not that you have to be prescriptive and say every little thing that's going to happen, I actually have to put that on a timeline. No, you can, you can write these basic scripts, which are going to say, like, for example, one, one great example actually is Unreal Engine is used by Guy Norris, who's a, a he's a action designer. He's a stunt designer. And what he's been able to do is he's been able to tune his virtual car, the car that exists in the engine, that in, exists in this gamification that he's created. It is the same as the car that he has. So he can tune the suspension. 
he knows that when it when it rolls a little bit as he's going around a turn, it's going to do the same thing in his car. So when he goes to shoot, he's already visualized everything. He's already rehearsed everything. At that point, it's just execution. And, mm. and not only that, but that the continuity is there for editorial. So this is the role that this tool is playing. And, and I think traditionally these computer, what we call DCCs, digital content creation tools. Traditionally, they have resided within the previs team and within visual effects. But I think what we're seeing now is that other departments are starting to take them on. So you also have the set designers are starting to design things, not only physically, but also virtually in the engine. So that when they arrive on set, they have the physical version and they also have the virtual version that goes on the wall and they're interchangeable. Yeah. Or you also have editorial, for example, where editorial used to be a, the process was I would get the shots and if it, I would get handles on either end and you would slide things around to make the story work. But if the motion didn't match from one shot to the next, you'd have to send the notes back and someone would have to change that. You couldn't, it, it, it just wouldn't work. It would be this hitch in, in the edit. Well, if some of the editors now are starting to operate in the Unreal Engine using Sequencer, and so what they're able to do is they can actually tweak these little fine points that make that edit work. So let's say I talked about the birds. Maybe those birds need to, it's just a millisecond off of when it just wasn't timed exactly right they can just slip that timeline a little bit. Mm -hmm. They never pass any note to anybody. They just do it right there. That's the power of this. I'm curious, can you share more about how widely adopted Unreal is in Hollywood with film and TV um, production at this point? And, and how much of that is productions that are truly trying to, by and large, use the LED screens, create a, a fully virtual production in that sense versus using it for previs and smarter planning ahead of a on location shop? That's a, actually a great question. So we're scratching the surface of this being widely adopted. I worked in at Industrial Light and Magic and Lucasfilm for many years. And the first time I interfaced with uh, a game engine was actually on AI, artificial intelligence. It was Spielberg's film. Well, he directed, but in that film, we actually used Unreal 1, the first version of it, just so that Spielberg could actually go in Rouge City, this, this one scene, so that he could figure out what shots he wanted to do. It's, it, it's not quite previs because it was accurate to, again, to what we were ultimately going to build with models, but it allowed us to know that what Rouge City is only going to be this one block. It's not going to be this three square blocks that was in the in all of the artwork so back then it was used that way what's happening right now is that this real-time ability this ability to see things instantaneously are really permeating every single department last year when you and i saw one another it was at seagraph actually that you and oh, i saw right. one another we there were about you know of the real interactive screens where perspective changed there were probably about three stages that were servicing the, the film industry. Right now, I'm tracking over 100 in the last year. Either some of them are built already or others are in the process of being built. There's truly an explosion that is happening right now, but it only makes sense. It, there has been this continuum of advancements that have been happening over the past 15, 20 years, but we're now getting to the point where I can see things in real time and I don't need to pay attention to these byproducts, these things that make me wait. Those are, those are going by the wayside. So naturally everyone is going to pick this up because this is a visual medium. Why would I not do this? Why would I not see the written word immediately in the image and start to um, play in that sandbox as opposed to waiting until post. So, uh, it, so more directly to answer your question, I think we're just on the on the precipice of 
this massive adoption, but it is a massive adoption that's going on right now. It's, yeah. it's, it's a significant sea change. What, what are the barriers still there? What has resulted in the adoption not being as fast as maybe otherwise could have? A big part of this is when you're talking about these major changes to the process of how you can produce something. This is an industry that's had a certain process for a very long time, has budgets allocated based on assumptions about you know, when certain work is done by who. How does this change the budgeting and correspondingly, what are the tensions you're running into in people trying to adopt this? So that's an awesome question because there's a couple components to this. So first of all, adoption has been incredibly fast, actually. And in, in me thinking, I mean, I like you, I'm like, what's taken so long? But then I look back and it's only been a year, right? That, that we've really, at least in in-camera visual effects, and that we're already starting to see it that pervasive. And not only that, but really democratized, where not only am I seeing the super high end from the studios that are these massive stages, I also saw this father and son team that they went and got some monitors from, from Costco or something and outfitted at their basement and started shooting their own little films and things like that. So, I, I mean, I am really seeing it be, be picked up. I think the other part of this is the Unreal Engine is free to download. So anyone, literally anyone listening to this, you could go download it and start to play with it. Not only that, but the same functionality that you have on these big stages is all in the engine right now. It's all there. You just have to know how to put it together. And then we have training that helps with that as well. The, now, that is the practical part of it. Now, let's talk about the business side of it. So there, there, I always like to say that there are three constituents here. There's the studio, there's the filmmaker, and there's the visual effects house or whoever it is that actually has to make that computer generated content. So let's start with the studio. The studios have, yes, they have teams of people that budget out shows. There is a, a way that if you are um, in a studio and anybody in the, in the industry, you can look at a budget and you can tell whether the people know what they're doing or not. You, you can tell whether or not they're going to be, based on the art, whether they're going to be able to meet their mark or not. They, I mean, it's, it's down to uh, really an art of being able to budget out a film. Now, what happens when something so significant as to take the in most 70% of what used to happen in post-production and you shift that onto the front? Well, someone who's doing the finance is going to look at that and go, I don't trust that. Like, wait, you yeah. know, yeah. wait a minute, hold on. You say that I have to spend this money up front and then, well, what happens in the back end if you don't get all that? And then you're going to be coming to ask me, no, there's too much risk in that. So that is a challenge. And that I think that there are some, there are some people that are wrapping their head around it and understanding how to budget for that and how to put in some safety valves as well for actually knowing when a production is doing well versus when it's facing some of the challenges. So that's one of the institutional things that is going to take some time. But the fact of the matter is just human nature is that if you put utility to something, I will adopt it. Meaning if it serves my purposes and makes my life easier, or make something cheaper or whatever, make something better, I'm going to do it. And so I think that we're, we're naturally seeing those things from the studio where they're recognizing, oh, wait a minute, this is going to ultimately allow me to make better content, more content. And, and I, I always hesitate to say cheaper because the creative process is a process and a lot of different things happening. But you can give better tools for people to be able to tell their story however they tell their story. And so, so I think these, this utility is allowing them to really take these quote unquote risks or do something different and, and, and everything. Now let's go to the filmmaker. The filmmaker is looking at this. Now they have something that they have to deliver. There's something very practical about getting something to the camera. 
and framing something and getting the lighting right. If they can see that they can do this and start to understand how it works at scale, not just doing one shot or two shots, but that they can do an entire movie or 50% of a movie or whatever it is, well, that's an interesting proposition to them. This takes a little bit of time for filmmakers because the studio has to line up, the, the production, all of the teams have to line up. Everybody has to be ready to deploy this in time for the director and the cinematographer to actually be on set and to, to film. So that's the other component. Again, very good reasons. And there's a lot of utility, especially now in the, the COVID age, there's a lot of utility to doing this. And so we are seeing that movement, but there's still that perceived risk. And then the last area is visual effects. Visual effects, it is a razor thin margin a lot of times that, they, that if anybody thinks they're going into visual effects to make money, I have a bridge to sell them. It's, <laughs> it, it's not a business. It's a passion. <laughs> That's what it is. And, and I, I say that with all due respect to everyone. I mean, it's a, a massive industry. Don't get me wrong, but it's an amazing amount of work that has to be put into that. So because there are those, those margins, what you're doing is you're amortizing any new technology that you're, you're applying. It, mm -hmm. Quite frankly, it's a bit cheaper to do things that have been done before rather than to do something new. Doing things new is very expensive and there's not a lot of profit in that. Mm -hmm. So one of the issues I think that some of the larger visual effects houses have is that they have invested a lot of money into these pipelines. And these pipelines allow them to scale work. It allows them to take on a show that maybe has 700 shots, but not only take on that one show, but ultimately have seven shows that are happening that do that. I mean, that's an amazing amount of data that you have to track in order to scale. That's what those pipelines do. And so for, for me, if I'm a visual effects house to just say, I'm gonna scrap that whole pipeline, that's a difficult pill to swallow. So again, all three of those things have to line up in order for us to just say, yes, we're doing everything in Game Engine. It is going to happen. It is happening. But we also have to have a little bit of patience. It, it is going to take a little while for us to rebuild some of those pipelines. Thinking about ultimately labor savings and cost savings that come from a more efficient process here, and looking at Unreal as a platform, how much of the risk mitigation for the different parties here is from the growing ecosystem of marketplace of assets, like with Quixel or tools built on top of Unreal by third parties, where you don't have to do everything from scratch yourself? It's a perfect storm, Eric. That's That's really what we're seeing, is there's this perfect storm of the hardware has gotten to the point where we can render photo real images in real time. The software, we have some incredible developers that are working on some of the most difficult problems in CG for the past 20 years. And they're, they're, they're making their way through those problems. It's the various storytellers and their willingness to do something new and look towards things new. There's, and then it's the audience. The audience and their insatiable <laughs> just desire for more and more and more content. It is all of these things that are happening at the same time. And how we approach the world right now as a result of this pandemic is very different. People have been taking in media and we need to make more and more. So when you say that this, from a budget point of view, is more efficient or cheaper, I'm always hesitant to say that that's necessarily going to be the case. But yes, it is more efficient. I, I always like to go back to Neil Bloomkamp did that District 9 film. And, and it was really successful. And the entire industry was like, oh my goodness, he did it on such an incredibly small budget, yet it looked like a big budget film and all that. What happened was Neil understood visual effects. And he wrote his story and he designed his shots with visual effects in mind. 
So he would have characters, digital characters would always walk in front of the physical characters. So he didn't have to do roto work. There were all of these things that he knew that were ultimately going to allow him to put more money into the the look and the story. And he could he could do that rather than doing more difficult things that weren't going to put the the dollars on the screen necessarily. It was yeah. going to put it in the technology. That's what we're dealing with today. It's the same thing. What does it take to go from that to saying, hey, we've already built so much of this in Unreal. We want to now do a VR experience or we want to create a video game. Can we use some of the exact same digital assets to make that faster and cheaper to do? So that's, I, I will tell you, so that's one of the things that the IP um, holders, that has them really excited because even just in filmmaking, what traditionally has happened is people build their assets. It can be four or five, six times the same asset because something happened different when it was in previs and then they threw that away. And then when it got into to visual effects, they rebuilt it. And then, oh, by the way, I had two previs companies and there are three visual effects houses. And well, that same asset needs to go into these different pipelines. And it, it was just, I think it was maddening to the studios. But if you can have something that what we call LODs, which is level of detail, where your assets are built in such a way that not only can I use them as a really, really high cinematic, high level asset, but then I could also do it for episodic on television and animation. And not only that, and you pointed out, right? I, I call it experiential, which is games or, or VR or just exploring an area. But what about parks? What about location-based entertainment? And, and what does that also do for the brand? Pixar is a great example. Pixar has the cars. Well, I want to make sure that asset, if I have it in television or I have it in parks or I have it wherever in, in advertising, I want it to be on brand. I want it to, I don't want it all of a sudden to move different or to look different. That is very difficult to do, but using a game engine and a consistent platform, you can do that. It's really exciting times along those lines to be able to be consistent with their assets and start to explore storylines that transcend just being in the theater or just being on TV where it all of a sudden in social media, I'm able to follow a character that went from the screen into social media and is talking about something that happened this morning and then move on into being something that's live action or something. Oh man, it just, and I don't think people are completely understanding quite yet what is going to be possible. So what does the future look like from your perspective and, and look at the scope of the next couple of years in the entertainment industry and the adoption of Unreal and greater virtual production, are there key milestones you see coming or, or tipping points? What do you expect? Well, I think I'm the most excited about the democratization of these tools. What it means is that we're gonna have people, not just the same people telling the same stories, we're gonna have people from all over the globe being able to tell new stories that we can all be excited about. And then those stories will also transcend just any one given platform. That is what is so exciting to me. As, as human beings, I tell you a story, you listen to the whole story, and then you like to tell, take that story and apply it to your experiences. I think in entertainment, we're going to have that ability to do what is simply natural to us. This is the way we live on this planet, how we exist and, and how we continue to, to survive is by telling each other stories and then being able to apply that knowledge to our own existence. Entertainment is about to go in that direction as well. Well, Miles, thanks so much for taking the time to chat today. This was wonderful. My pleasure. I get excited every time I get an opportunity to talk about it because it is so fresh, so new, and so exciting. 
Thanks for listening to the Monetizing Media Podcast. You can join my Monetizing Media newsletter and find other resources, like a database of investors who focus on media and entertainment startups, at monetizingmedia.com.